the Snow Queen. Listen, we are beginning our story. When we arrive at the end of it, we shall, it is to be hoped, know more than we do now. There was once a magician, a wicked magician, a most wicked magician. Great was his delight at having constructed a mirror possessing this peculiarity that everything good and beautiful, when reflected in it, shrank up almost to nothing, whilst those things that were ugly and useless were magnified and made to appear ten times worse than before. The loveliest landscapes reflected in this mirror looked like boiled spinach, and the handsomest persons appeared odious or as if standing upon their heads, their features being so distorted that their friends could never have recognized them. Moreover, if one of them had a freckle, he might be sure that it would seem to spread over the nose and mouth. And if a good or pious thought glanced across his mind, a wrinkle was seen in the mirror. All this the magician thought highly entertaining, and he chuckled with delight at his own clever invention. Those who frequented the school of magic where he taught spread abroad the fame of this wonderful mirror and declare that by its means the world and its inhabitants might be seen now for the first time as they really were. They carried the mirror from place to place till at last there was no country nor person that had not been misrepresented in it. Its admirers now must needs fly up to the sky with it to see if they could not carry on their sport even there. But the higher they flew, the more wrinkled did the mirror become. They could scarcely hold it together. They flew on and on, higher and higher, till at last the mirror trembled so fearfully that it escaped from their hands and fell to the earth, breaking into millions, billions and trillions of pieces. And then it caused far greater unhappiness than before, for fragments of it, scarcely so large as a grain of sand, would be flying about in the air and sometimes get into people's eyes, causing them to view everything the wrong way, or to have power to see only what was perverted and corrupt, each little fragment having retained the peculiar properties of the entire mirror. Some people were so unfortunate as to receive a little splinter into their hearts. That was terrible. The heart became cold and hard, like a lump of ice. Some pieces were large enough to be used as window panes, but it was of no use to look at one's friends through such panes as those. Other fragments were made into spectacles. And then what trouble people had with setting and resetting them. Shin was greatly amused with all this, and he laughed till his sides ached. <laughs> there are still some little splinters of this mischievous mirror flying about in the air. We shall hear more about them very soon. There dwelt in a large town two poor children whose garden was scarcely larger than a flower pot. They were not brother and sister, but they loved each other as much as if they had been, and their parents lived in two attics exactly opposite. The roof of one neighbor's house nearly joined the other, the gutter ran along between, and there was in each roof a little window so that you could stride across the gutter from one window to the other. The parents of the children had large window boxes, in each of which grew a beautiful little rose tree. The little boy was called Kay, the little girl's name was Gerda. In summertime they could get out of the windows and jump over to each other, but in winter there were stairs to run down, and stairs to run up, and sometimes the wind roared and the snow fell. One evening, Gerda's grandmother said to the little boy, Those are the white bees swarming there. Have they a queen bee? They have. She flies yonder where they swarm so thickly. She is the largest of them and never remains upon the earth, but flies up again into the black cloud. 
Sometimes on a winter's night, she flies through the streets of the town and breathes with her frosty breath upon the windows, and then they are covered with strange and beautiful forms, like trees and flowers. Yes, I've seen them. Can the Snow Queen come in here? If she does come in, I'll put her on the warm stove, and then she'll melt. And the grandmother stroked Kay's hair and told him some stories. That same evening, after he had gone home, he crept upon the chair by the window. Just then, a few snowflakes fell outside, and one, the largest of them, grew larger and larger, and at last took the form of a lady, dressed in the finest white crepe, her attire being composed of millions of star-like particles. She was exquisitely fair and delicate, but entirely of ice, glittering, dazzling ice. Her eyes gleamed like two bright stars, but there was no rest nor repose in them. She nodded at the window and beckoned with her hand. The little boy was frightened and jumped and fancied he saw a large white bird fly past the window. There was a clear frost next day and soon afterwards came spring. The trees and flowers budded, the swallows built their nests, the windows were opened, and the little children sat once more in their little garden upon the gutter that ran along the roofs of the houses. The roses blossomed beautifully that summer, and the little girl had learned a hymn which she sang to the little boy, and he sang it with her. One day, Kay and Gerda were sitting looking at their picture book full of birds and animals, when suddenly, the clock on the old church tower was just striking five, Kay exclaimed, Oh dear, what was that shooting pain in my heart? And now again, something has certainly got into my eye. The little girl turned and looked at him. He blinked his eyes. No, there was nothing to be seen. I believe it's gone. But gone, it was not. It was one of those glass splinters from the magic mirror, the wicked glass which made everything great and good reflected in it to appear little and hateful, and which magnified everything ugly and mean. Poor Kay had also received a splinter in his heart. It would now become hard and cold like a lump of ice. He felt the pain no longer, but the splinter was there. <laughs> Why do you cry, Gerda? You look so ugly when you cry. There's nothing the matter with me. <laughs> this rose has an insect in it. Just look at this. After all, they're ugly roses, and it's an ugly box they grow in. Oh, Kay, what are you doing? You've kicked the box over and torn off the roses. But when he saw how it grieved her, he tore off another rose and jumped down through his own window, away from his once dear little Gerda. Ever afterwards, when she brought forward the picture book, he called it a baby's book. And when her grandmother told stories, he kept interrupting her. And sometimes, whenever he could manage it, he'd get behind her, put on her spectacles and speak just as she did. He did this in a very droll manner, and so people laughed at him. Very soon he could mimic everybody in the street. All that was singular and awkward about them could Kay imitate. And his neighbours said... What a remarkable head remarkable, that boy has. Remarkable. But no, it was the glass splinter which had fallen into his eye. The glass splinter which had pierced his heart. It was these which made him regardless of whose feelings he wounded and even made him tease little Gerda who loved him so fondly. One winter's day when it was snowing, Kay came in with thick gloves on his hands and his sledge slung across his back. He called out to Gerda, I've got leave to drive in the great square where the other boys play. And away he went. The boldest boys in the square used to fasten their sledges firmly to the wagons of the country people and thus drive a good way along with them. This they thought particularly pleasant. Whilst they were in the midst of their play, a large sleigh painted white passed by. In it sat a person wrapped in a rough white fur and wearing a rough white cap. When the sleigh had driven twice round the square, Kay bound to it his little sledge and was carried on with it. On they went, faster and faster into the next street. The person who drove the large sleigh turned round and nodded kindly to Kay, 
just as if they had been old acquaintances, and every time turned and nodded again, as if they. So Kay sat still, and they passed. Then the snow began to fall so thickly that the little boy couldn't see his own hand, but he was still carried on. He tried hastily to unloose the cords and free himself from the large sleigh, but it was of no use. His little carriage could not be unfastened and glided on as swift as the wind. Then he cried out as loud as he could, but no one heard him. The snow fell and the sleigh flew. Every now and then it made a spring as if driving over hedges and ditches. He was very much frightened. He would have repeated, Our Father, but he could remember nothing but the multiplication table. The snowflakes seemed larger and larger. At last they looked like great white fowls. All at once they fell aside. The large sleigh stopped. And the person who drove it arose from the seat. He saw that the cap and coat were entirely of snow, then slender and dazzlingly white. It was the Snow Queen. And she spoke to him. We have driven fast, but no one likes to be frozen. Creep under my bearskin cloak. And she seated him in the sleigh by her side and spread her cloak around him. He felt as if he was sinking into a drift of snow. Are you still cold? And she kissed his brow. Oh, her kiss was colder than ice. It went to his heart, and he entirely forgot little Gerda, her grandmother, and all at home. Kay looked at her. She was so beautiful. A more intelligent, more lovely countenance he could not imagine. She no longer appeared to him ice, cold ice, as at the time when she sat outside the window and beckoned to him. In his eyes, she was perfect. He felt no fear. She flew with him high up into the black cloud, and the storm raged. It seemed now to Kay as though it were singing songs of olden time. They flew over woods and over lakes, over sea and over land. Beneath them the cold wind whistled, the wolves howled, the snow glittered, and the black crow flew cawing over the plain whilst above them shone the moon, so clear and tranquil. Thus they spend the long, long winter night. All day he slept at the feet of the Snow Queen. But how fared it with little Gerda when Kay never returned? She wept much and long, for the boys said he must be dead. He must have been drowned in the river that flowed not far from the town. Oh, how long and dismal the winter days were now. At last came the spring with its warm sunshine. One morning she thought to herself, I will put on my new red shoes, those which Kerry has never seen, and then I will go down to the river and ask after him. And she went alone through the gates of the town and on to the river. And she asked, Is it true that thou hast taken my little playfellow away? I will give thee my red shoes if thou wilt restore him to me. And the wavelets of the river flowed towards her in a manner which she fancied was unusual. She fancied that they intended to accept the offer. So she took off her red shoes, though she prized them more than anything else she possessed, and threw them into the stream. But they fell near the shore, and the little waves bore them back to her as though they would not take from her what she most prized, as they had not got little Kay. However, she thought she had not thrown the shoes far enough, so she stepped into a little boat which lay among the reeds by the shore, and standing at the farthest end of it, threw them from thence into the water. The boat was not fastened, and her movements in it caused it to glide away from the shore. She saw this and hastened to get out, but by the time she reached the other end of the boat, it was more than a yard distant from the land. She couldn't escape, and the boat glided on. Little Gerda was much frightened and began to cry, but no one besides the sparrows heard her, and they could not carry her back to the land. Perhaps the river may bear me to my dear Kay. At last, she glided past a large cherry garden, wherein stood a little cottage with thatched roof and curious red and blue windows. An old lady came out, supporting herself on a big hooked stick. 
She wore a large hat with most beautiful flowers painted on it, and she said, Thou poor little child, the mighty flowing river has indeed borne thee a long, long way. And she walked right into the water, seized the boat with her stick, and drew it to land, and took out the little girl. Come and tell me who thou art and how thou camest hither. And Gerda told her all. They went together into the cottage, and the old lady shut the door. I have long wished for such a dear little girl. We shall see if we cannot live very happily together. And as she combed little Gerda's hair, the child thought less and less of her foster brother Kay, for the old lady was an enchantress. She did not, however, practice magic for the sake of mischief, but merely for her own amusement. And now she wished very much to keep little Gerda to live with her. So fearing that if Gerda saw her roses, she would be reminded of her own roses and of little Kay, and that then she might run away, the old lady went out into the garden and waved her hooked stick over all her rose bushes, upon which, although they were full of leaves and blossoms, they immediately sank into the black earth, and no one would have guessed that such plants had ever grown there. Then she led Gerda into this flower garden. Oh, how beautiful and how fragrant it was! Gerda bounded with delight and played among the flowers in the warm sunshine, and many more days were spent in the same manner. Gerda knew every flower in the garden, but numerous as they were, it seemed to her that one was wanting. She could not tell which. She was sitting one day looking at her hostess's hat, which had flowers painted on it, and behold, the loveliest among them was a rose. The old lady had entirely forgotten the painted rose on her hat when she made the real roses disappear from her garden and sink into the ground. This is often the case when things are done hastily. What? Are there no roses in the garden? And Gerda ran from one bed to another, sought and sought again, but no rose was to be found. She sat down and wept, <laughs> and it so chanced that her tears fell on a spot where a rose tree had formerly stood, and as soon as her warm tears had moistened the earth, the bush shot up anew, as fresh and as blooming as it was before it had sunk into the ground, and Gerda threw her arms around it, kissed the blossoms, and immediately recalled to memory the beautiful roses at home, and her little playfellow Kay. Oh, how could I stay here so long? I left my home to seek for Kay. Do you not know where he is, oh, darling roses? Do you think that he is dead? Dead he is not. We have been down in the earth. The dead are there, but not Kay. Thank you. And she went to the other flowers, bent low over their cups, and asked, Know you not where little Kay is? But every flower stood in the sunshine, dreaming its own little tale. Ding dong rang the hyacinth bells. We told not for little Kay. We know him not. We do but sing our own song, the only one we know. And Gerda went to the buttercup, which shone so brightly from among her smooth green leaves, and said to it, Thou art like a little bright sun. Tell me if thou canst where to find my playfellow. And the buttercup glittered so brightly and looked at Gerda. What song could the buttercup sing? Nothing about little Kay. And what said the Narcissus? I can look at myself. I can see myself. Oh, how sweet is my fragrance. I can look at myself. I see myself. I don't care if you can. And little Gerda, with bare feet, ran out into the wide world. How long I must have stayed there. So it is now autumn. Well, then, there is no time to lose. And she rose to pursue her way. Oh, how sore and weary were her little feet, and all around looked so cold and barren. Gerda was again obliged to stop and take rest. Suddenly, a large raven hopped upon the snow in front of her, saying, quack, quack, good day, good day, quack, She told the raven the history of her life and fortunes and asked if he had seen Kay. And the raven nodded his head half doubtfully and said, uh, I think I know. I think it may be little Kay, but he has certainly forsaken thee for a princess. Dwells he with a princess? In the kingdom wherein we are now sitting, there dwells a princess, a most uncommonly clever princess. And a while ago she determined she would marry. 
but declared that the man whom she would choose must be able to answer sensibly whenever people spoke to him and must be good for something else besides merely looking grand and stately. Believe me, every word I say is true, for I have a tame beloved who hops at pleasure about the palace, and she has told me all this. Ah, ah, ah. The people all crowded to the palace, but it was all of no use. The young men could speak well enough while they were outside the palace gates, but when they entered and saw the royal guard in silver uniform and the lackeys on the staircase in gold and the spacious ballroom all lighted up, they were quite confounded. They stood before the throne where the princess sat and it was just as though they had been struck dumb the moment they entered the palace. But Kay, little Kay, when did he... Kay, little Kay, when did he... Kay, little Kay, when did he come? Was he among the crowd? Ah, presently! On the third day arrived a youth with neither horse nor carriage. Gaily he marched up to the palace. His eyes sparkled like yours, but he was very meanly clad. That was Kay. Oh, then I have found him. He merrily went up to the princess who was sitting upon a pearl as large as a spinning wheel. He did not come to woo her, he said. He had only come to hear the wisdom of the princess, and he liked her much. And she liked him in return. Yes, to be sure that was Kay. Oh, will you not take me into the palace? Ah, that is easily said. But how is it to be done? I will talk it over with my tame beloved. Wait for me at the trellis yonder. And away he flew. He did not return till late in the evening. Ah, ah, my tame beloved greets you kindly and sends you a piece of bread which she took from the kitchen. She knows a little back staircase leading to the sleeping apartments. And they went into the garden, down the grand avenue, where the leaves dropped upon them as they passed along. Oh, how Gerda's heart beat with fear and expectation. They went up the back staircase. A small lamp placed on a cabinet gave a glimmering light. On the floor stood a tame raven. <sighs> My betrothed has told me much about you. If you will take the lamp, I will show you the way. It seems to me as if someone were behind us. And in fact, there was a rushing sound as of something passing. Strange-looking shadows flitted rapidly along the wall. Horses with long, slender legs and fluttering manes. Huntsmen, knights and ladies. The tame raven explained. These are only dreams. The apartments through which they passed vied with each other in splendor, and at last they reached the bedchamber. In the center of this room stood a pillar of gold resembling the stem of a large palm tree whose leaves of glass formed the ceiling. And hanging from the tree near the floor on thick golden stalks were two beds in the form of lilies. The one was white wherein reposed the princess. The other was red, and here must surely be Kay. She called him by his name aloud, held the lamp close to him. The dreams again rushed by. He woke, turned his head, and behold, it was not Kay. And the princess looked out from the white lily petals and asked what was the matter. Then little Gerda wept and told her whole story and what the ravens had done for her. And the prince and princess pitied her. And the prince got up out of his bed and let Gerda sleep in it. And she folded her little hands, thinking, How kind both men and animals are to me. She closed her eyes and slept soundly and sweetly. And all the dreams flitted about her. The next day she was dressed from head to foot in silk and velvet. And they gave her boots and a muff besides. She was dressed so prettily. And as soon as she was ready, there drove up to the door a new carriage of pure gold with the arms of the prince and princess glittering upon it like a star. The coachman, footman and outriders all wearing gold crowns. The carriage was well provided with sugar plums, fruit and gingerbread nuts. The prince and princess cried, Farewell. Farewell. Little Gerda wept. And the raven wept and said goodbye. This was the saddest parting of all. And he flew up to the branch of a tree and flapped his black wings as long as he could see the carriage, which shone like the brightest sunshine.